It's my enormous pleasure to introduce our first spe speaker, Julian Cribb. Now, you've got your notes, and there's a really extensive formal bi bibliography of Julian there. You haven't got notes? No. Have some of you got the notes on the table? They look like this. No, they're just, they're just yours. They're just mine. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to do it then. We can, we can circulate them if people want them. Okay. Yeah, we can do all that. But, but he's, a, he's, a, he's a big man like that, so I don't want to go through that because I want to actually talk to you about what I've learnt about him because I think that's probably what you don't know. And what I've learnt about him is he's a classic scholar. He actually studied Greek classics at school and university. And as part of his university degree, he translated... Um, the Odyssey into English from the, from the original Greek. So he's always been a communicator. And when I asked him, well, what was it about that that interested him? He said, well, those ancient societies give you a sense of values, of tradition, of history. And, and what I know of him, I think we're going to get a sense of that. He's, he's got a long-term view of how the world works. It's perhaps come from, you know, 4,000 years ago in the study that he's done. But he didn't come to agriculture, from, to classics. He, he got a sense of how the world works. But as a young, when he was at uni, he studied, he studied journalism and he made some living out of writing articles. And he got his, a big break as a journalist in Western Australia. And it was during the 1970s. And some of you will be old enough to remember that 1970s was problems with beef, problems with wool, problems with drought. Life was really tough. So he was a young journalist over in WA and he came across some of the, quote, most courageous, most resilient, most intelligent farmers that he'd ever met. And those WA farmers, he said they were first or second generation, they weren't caught up in history, and they really inspired him about agriculture. He loved their intelligence, he loved their innovation, and he loved their ability to solve problems. So that took the city bloke to agriculture. So then the other thing that was part of the whole story, that's got him interested in agriculture and he stayed there, but he's got a passion. He's just not an ordinary man who thinks agriculture is important, because lots of us think that. He, in my talking with him, he's got a real passion about injustice and inefficiency. <laughs> he hates injustice and he hates when money's not used well. But the story goes, I said, well, how did you come across this um, injustice business? And he said, well, he was hanging on the fringe of the science world. And what he discovered was some scientists have this really strong sense of ownership of knowledge. They own it, they patent it, and they keep it locked up. And he hated that because he could see how unfair it was that the rest of us didn't have access to the knowledge. So he's a man absolutely committed to making knowledge freely available. Thus, he's a communicator. But it's not just knowledge that he wants everyone to have access to. It's this idea of inefficiency. <laughs> he actually believes that money's not the answer. You can have a lot of money, but it won't solve the problem. He says it's people and it's people's use of knowledge that will be the solution. And it's, he, he hates the idea that we throw money at everything thinking that will solve it, whereas in fact it's learning and it's people who do it. So that all ties up together because what we've actually got with Julian is a communicator, a man passionately committed to helping people understand things. So I know we're in for a huge treat today. I've asked him to speak for 35 minutes and at the end of that time we'll get to talk in our tables about what sense we've made for about 10 minutes and then we've got a chance to have an informed discussion back with him before we break for morning tea. So would you please make him welcome. Cathy, ladies and gentlemen, look, it's a great honour and a privilege to be asked to speak with you. I don't know whether I can live up to the, uh, the, the forward publicity, but I will do my very best. But I'm going to try and put you in context for what is happening worldwide. I mean... The, the, the Goulburn Break and Catchment is just a pixel in the scene, the world food scene, but it's a very, very important one. And I hope by the end of my talk you will see how it can change the entire world scene. Now we... Come on. Right. We're facing what I believe to be the greatest challenge in all of human history. How we are going to feed 10 billion people sustainably for more than half a century until we can get the population down. Now, tonight, there is going to be 216,000 more people to dinner than there were last night. Uh, population growth is going. It's slowing down a little bit, 
but it's still expanding. Uh, it's not so much babies being born, it's actually people living longer. So it's not readily solved in that sense. At the same time, countries like Brazil, China, India, they're all eating higher up the food chain. They're eating meat, they're eating Kentucky Fried, whatever it is. Um, but this combination is going to double food demand by the 2060s. And that's the challenge that we all face. Now, we could solve that problem like we did in the 1970s with Green Revolution technologies. And, you know, that would be the logical thing to do. But it's not going to work that way twice. And the reason is this. We are running out of just about everything that you need to produce good food. We're running out of land. We're running out of water. We're running out of oil. We're running out of nutrients. We're running out of fish. We're running out of stable climates. We're running out of R&D. And we're running out of money. Money is being transferred from the rural sector to the urban sector all over the world right now. So the investment capital is not there that is needed to drive the next revolution in agriculture. My point, the point that I made in my book, and which I'm trying to get people to understand, is it is not one or two of those things that is the challenge. It is all ten of them coming together at the one time. It is the synergy between all of these immense constraints and shortages and the massive increase in demand that makes this such a difficult problem. And I think you will probably begin to get a sense of this as I, as I talk about specific bits of the problem. But essentially, the world is like the Indian blind men feeling the elephant. Each one feels a, a bit and he describes a tree or a snake or something. They're not seeing the whole animal, right? The governments of the world are not seeing the whole elephant in terms of the food problem. OK, let's talk about water briefly. You know, wherever you look, water is running out. It's becoming scarce, it's becoming expensive. Groundwater is being mined in every country that uses it to grow food. The rivers are drying out. That's the Colorado, but you could have taken a similar picture of the Murray-Darling mouth, uh, you know, not so long ago. Lake Chad, you know, a, a, a lake that supports 40 million Africans, farmers and fishermen, has 90% gone in 30 years. You know, um, the, the glaciers are shrinking. You've, you've all read what's happening in the Arctic. Well, you know, in, in the Hindu Kush, in Indonesia, the high mountains, these, these enormous reserves of fresh water, the ice pack, are disappearing. And, and, that, and that means that rivers that flow year-round are going to only flow for half the year, basically, and so farmers will grow one crop instead of two. Groundwater is phenomenally important for, for food production, not so much in Australia, but in a lot of other countries. And every country that's using it. In America, the Ogallala Aquifer has, uh, is three quarters empty. In the North China Plain, you know, the, the, the groundwater is, is three quarters empty. On the Indo-Gangetic Plains, it's about 60% empty now. So we're taking it out much faster than it can replenish. We've treated it like an inexhaustible resource, and it isn't. So basically, this is the International Water Management Institute's prediction. They're seeing water scarcity um, caused by various causes, economic in some cases, physical in others, uh, spreading really across the most populous band. If you take that sort of band where the orange stuff is, three billion human beings live in that band. You know, and, and there is this growing, by the 2030s, this is really going to start impacting on world agriculture. And there are other factors involved in this. Now, you know, it's not just me that's saying this. This is coming from very respectable sources. So you've got the world's number one <coughs> science journal warning about, you know, potentially millions of people dying as a result of water shortages. You've got, you know, the, the, the Secretary General of the United Nations saying that this is a much bigger problem than we have hitherto imagined it to be. Okay. That's actually, this is the North China Plain. Now, the North China Plain <coughs> feeds 400 million people. Okay, it's where they grow the wheat, where they grow the vegetables, in the north of China, very good soils and all of that. But look at the, um, look what's happened to the water table. It's gone from about, you know, six metres or, or there about, uh, about below the surface down to 30 metres. They have collapsed the top aquifer. They're never going to get water back into that aquifer because there ain't no room between the, the sand grains for it to go. So that's, a, that's a, just a typical example of what is happening. And the cities, that, although they're building these huge canals from the south of China to the north, those canals will only supply enough water for the huge cities. They will not supply enough water for food. So what is going to happen in China's food bowl? 
Then the other thing is that uh, everyone else wants your water, okay? We, we've, we've seen this coal seam gas debate that is roaring away, and the coal mines and things like that. The energy sector is going to triple its demand for water over the coming 50 years. This gas rush is not just in Australia, it's worldwide. It's in Brazil, it's in China, it's in Canada, it's in the United States. Gas companies are taking the farmers' water in one way or another. They are either disrupting the aquifers, they're pumping them dry as they seek to get the gas out, they're polluting them, whatever. Uh, you know, they will, they will mine the gas in 10 years and be gone, but the aquifer, which could have lasted 10,000 years, will not be there. It will, will, be, will be brutally damaged. Manufacturing is, is needing more water. The environment is needing more water. We've had that debate in the Murray-Darling Basin. And of course, if you're going to double food production, you need to double water, theoretically. But in reality, and this is where we start to see the interaction of these forces, you're going to have to double food production with half the water. Okay, so we don't just need a 100% increase in water use efficiency. Two or 300% more like. So you can see the scale of these challenges. So we've got 50 years to do this, right? So we've got time, but you can see why it's urgent. We need to start acting now. Yeah, uh, Colin Chartres, the head of IWIMI, Aussie, says uh, we need 11,000 Sydney harbours of water to produce, to encompass this additional food that we're going to have to produce. You know, that just gives you a sort of a, a rough concept of how much water we're talking about here. Okay, let's talk about land. Now, obviously the area of land we use to produce food per person has, has dropped dramatically as the population enlarged and as farmers got much more efficient. Okay, so that's the trend. But by 2050, the average person on Earth will be supported by 1.5 hectares of land. Now, the interesting thing, this is, this is really intriguing to me, because the economists have told us for years, oh, if the you know, food is scarce, the price goes up. If the price goes up, farmers will open up more land and, and grow more food. You'd have thought so, wouldn't you? Well, the statistics from the FAO say that that's not happening. In fact, in eight out of the last ten years, the area of farmland worldwide <coughs> has contracted. So if there's a, an economic signal there, then nobody's listening. You know, so the actual area of the world's food-producing land is shrinking at the moment. Heaven knows why. Well, I think I can tell you why. On top of that, the area that we can farm effectively is being continually degraded. Now, we've been talking about soil degradation in this country since the 1940s. Uh, we've done quite a lot about it, you know. We, we have really improved our game no end. But if you take a look worldwide, that is not the case. Currently, the estimates that I have seen, and there are several different estimates, this is just one of them, we are actually losing between 75 billion and 100 billion tonnes of topsoil every year. And all right, some of it is going to blow onto the next farm or just go down the river to the next sort of, you know, valley. But eventually it's all going to end up on the bottom of the ocean where you can't use it for farming. So basically what they're saying is if we keep on degrading the planet at this rate, we've got somewhere between 50 and 70 years of topsoil left. Now, if we run out of oil, we can replace it with another form of energy. If we run out of nutrients, we can maybe recycle nutrients. Topsoil is a pretty scarce commodity, and it takes a hell of a long time, millions of years, to make it. So that is a real concern, and governments have taken their eye off this fundamental issue in agriculture. That's the FAO's latest report on it, the, the uh, state of the world's land and water. Uh, basically, as you can see, 10% of the world's farming area is said to be improving. Well, I think here in Australia we would have said we were improving our farmlands until we got the floods. And then we discovered that you know, soil erosion was not under control. They certainly found that out in Queensland, and you can tell me whether we found it out in Victoria or not. But basically, you know, we still have a problem with the mobility of soils. Um, and in most of the world, they aren't even on top of wind erosion. So... You know, this is, this is a real crisis, but it's also a bloody big opportunity for those of you who know how to fix this problem to get that knowledge out there. That was the United Nations, the FAO's conclusions that basically land and water systems, whole systems, you know, run the risk of breaking down completely if we don't get this problem. I mean, you really only have to think about the Middle East. Think about the, bloody, the fertile crescent that Father Abraham and all his flocks and herds came across. Think about the forest that used to be in Lebanon. 
You know, those areas are flat and bare as a billiard table today through human activity in the last 5,000 years. So something has to be done somehow to start bringing this planet back from the brink. The knowledge to do that is probably among the most precious of human knowledge. <coughs> now, the other thing that is eating up farmland is bloody big cities, right? By 2050, there will be a large number of cities of between 20, 30 and 40 million people, right? So there will be cities like Jakarta and Manila will be about 50% larger in population than Australia. You know, individual cities. And these cities, if you add them all together, will occupy an area of the Earth's surface the size of China. And their recreational catchment, and that's the bit with all the horse farms and the, you know, the, the salad blocks and the, uh, the, the day spas and the holiday farms, that will occupy an area of the world the size of the United States of America. And none of that land is really going to see productive agriculture again because it will be too expensive for farmers to afford. So we, the cities are basically eating into our productive land base. And obviously, you know, your catchment here is right at the bloody interface and you're feeling these pressures already. Um, but it, it's going to be subtracted from food production. That's my point. Unless we do something rather clever about it. And we will do. There's something else about these big cities, and they are different from the cities of history in this special way. They grow almost none of their own food. So you're going to have massive cities like Shanghai and Mumbai, uh, you know, 30 million people sustained only by a river of trucks coming every night to restock the shops. Now, what is going to happen if there is an oil crisis? A local war, a big flood like they had in Bangkok a couple of months ago. Actually, we know the answer to that because when they had big floods in Queensland and the Sunshine Coast was cut off, the supermarket shelves were stripped bare in less than 48 hours. So what happens in a city of 30 million people if the trucks can't get through for a week? I leave it to your imagination, but I suspect we are going to see this at some time in the next 20 maybe 30 years, and it's not going to be a pretty sight. Now, peak oil has already been and gone, OK? Um, I, I think, you know, there are a lot of arguments about how much oil there is and how long it's going to last and what it's going to cost. The statistic I want to leave you with is that 61 million new cars will hit the world, world's roads this year. There are already 750 million motor vehicles in the world, and there are going to be basically 1.2 billion motor vehicles by the 2020s. So the rate at which we are building cars is going up far faster than the rate at which we are finding new oil and gas. And the new oil and gas we're finding, a lot of it is much more expensive anyway because it's in places that are harder to get to. So one way or another, oil is going to become prohibitively expensive. I mean, I, I don't think that anybody in agriculture will be using fossil oil in the 2040s. The question is, what will you be using? You know, what are we actually doing at the moment to come up with the new energy systems for agriculture? Now, is it going to be hydrogen? Is it going to be solar? Is it going to be biodiesel? Is it going to be a combination of all of those? We have not addressed this. The food industry uses 30% of the world's energy in total. Not just ag agriculture is only a small part of that. But you think of all the, you know, the chillers and the cool stores and the trucks and things like that, 30%. So energy is a critical element. This is a problem that is looming for us now, which we, we as a species have not got our head around. The other one is that, you know, that, that wonderful shopping trolley full of fresh food there, that's what the average Western family chucks in the garbage every month. Half of your efforts, half of the efforts of the world's farmers and scientists are going to landfill. We are the first generation in the whole of human history to throw away half our food. I know what my grandmother would say about that, and I've got a fair idea what your grandmother would say about it as well. She would say, you're a pack of idiots, you know. Do not waste your food. Food is the most precious thing. It keeps you alive. Yet we are doing that. And 
the point is we, we, we can afford to do that because we've got these artificial fertilisers. We've had them now for 70, 80, 100 years. But the point is they are mined. And we all know that mines come to an end or they become prohibitively expensive to operate. We are motoring through the world's phosphate reserves. 66% of the world's phosphate comes from Morocco. Has anybody stopped to ask what happens if Morocco has an Arab Spring? You know, we're not going to be getting any super for a few years if they, if they have a revolution in Morocco. So, you know, this is again a situation that we ought not to tolerate. And we ought to be thinking about how we are going to solve the problem of resource scarcity in nutrients. But it's not on the national agenda of Australia, or as far as I can make out, of any other country at the moment, except perhaps China. The climate in which agriculture was born is changing probably for all time. The changes are going to be quite big. Two degrees of global warming is locked in by 2050. Okay? That's not going to have a vast impact on Australia, but it will require some adjustment in you know, crop varieties and, and uh, mixtures and the interplay between crops and livestock and things like that. But by the end of the century, if we keep on burning coal at the current rate, you will not be growing stone fruit in Victoria because you'll be five to six degrees hotter winter and summer. And, you know, at that level, agriculture does start to take some body blows. Quite what they mean for agriculture, nobody really knows. The scientific guesstimates that I have seen are that basically we lose about 10% of the world's food supply for every degree of global warming. Um, can we compensate for the 50% loss that we're likely to incur over 100 years? The answer is yes, easily. But then can we then produce another 100% of food on top of that? So you can see what I mean. This is starting to be a compounding problem. Now, you, you've got to farm 50% more efficiently just to offset climate change, and then you've got to farm 100% more, more efficiently than that to feed the world. So you know, the challenge, the knowledge, the technology, the skills that your grandkids are going to need you know, is of another order over and above what, what we're doing today. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we are starving the racehorse that wins the race. You know, we, in Australia, in Victoria, and around the world, we have more or less given up investing in agricultural science and technology. Okay? The amount of investment that is going on in agricultural science is about the same today as it was in the early 1970s, when there were only three and a half billion people on the planet. So we've actually halved the human intellectual input into agriculture, into, into de devising the technologies and the crop varieties and the things that you guys need to sustain and increase your production. That's been taken away from you. And, you know, I mean, this, for example, the red line up there is the amount of money that has been invested in international agricultural research in real terms. <coughs> And it looks like the cardiac trace of a dead patient, doesn't it? Anyway, so, so the intellectual effort you know, that sustains the global food enterprise is, is running down. And the point about this is that the technology, even if we started this up today, it takes about 25 years to do the science, the development, the commercialisation, and then disseminate that across hundreds of millions of farmers worldwide. <coughs> So it takes a generation, basically, to move a, a, a big piece of new knowledge. I mean, it took the better part of, of that time to move minimum tillage, you know, uh, through, through Australian agriculture. It still hasn't arrived in some places. Um, so, so, you know, uh, and what is happening is that the rate of, of, of gain in, in crop yields worldwide is stagnating. In some countries, it's going backwards. Um, in others, it is just kind of hanging in there. But it's no longer advancing like it did in the 70s and the 80s. We're no longer getting 10, 20, and 30% and 50% yield increases because we have taken our foot off the accelerator, ladies and gentlemen. We spend about $50 billion every year worldwide, private and public, on science and technology for agriculture. We, the human race, also spend $1.6 trillion on weapons. So we actually spend 50 times more on better ways to kill one another than we do on better ways to feed one another. 
you know, and this is an act of irrationality, you know, on a global scale that needs to be pointed out both to governments and to the public. You know, we are under investing, and by the way, you know, all the countries that have had wars in the last 30 years are countries that are food, land and water insecure. And the countries, how many wars have there been in Australia? How many wars have there been in Northern Europe? How many wars have there been in America and Canada? The places where people have full tummies are not places where people have wars. You know, war, underneath, you scrape away all the politics and the religion and the ethnicity in, in, in these conflicts, in Darfur or, or Rwanda or Eritrea or those sorts of places. You find people are arguing over food, land and water and how are we going to feed the kids? So, you know, and we know these problems are easily solved by throwing a bit of agricultural brain power and money at it. Anyway, so here's the challenge, and it's a daunting one. It is not for our generation to actually solve that, but we need to start doing so. But let me say, like all challenges, the opportunities are immense. So even if it, you know, it, it is our grandchildren who will have the task of completing this challenge, but we must start it now. And let me now talk about those opportunities because they are very, very exciting and many of them apply to this area. I just want to point out one other thing to you because you are interested in this thing. We actually have a food system that today, which according to the Public Health Association of Australia, is a wonderful commercial <coughs> success and a catastrophic health system failure. And what they're referring to is the fact that half of all Australians, half of Americans, half of Europeans, half of affluent people all over the world now die as a result of what they eat. Okay, they are dying from diet-related diseases like heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, obesity, liver and kidney problems. So our diet is not as wonderful <laughs> as we sometimes try to make out, as Master Chef might make out. You know, we actually have to rethink the diet <laughs> while we're rethinking the agriculture. Here's a, li a little connection with the soil. I mean, if you ate um, a, a cabbage or a lettuce or a tomato in America in 1914, you would get four times the nutrient, the, the, the uh, mineral nutrients out of it that you would get if you ate the same tomato today. And we have mined the soils, and we're putting in all the NPK, but we've forgotten about the micronutrients and things like that. I mean, just think about this. We have to eat five tomatoes for every one our grandparents ate to get the same nourishment. And this is important because, in actual fact, there are close correlations between micronutrients and human disease, diseases like heart disease, uh, you know, bronchitis, asthma, bone deformities. So these things are not just you know, little, little issues. It's really important that we discover ways to, to recharge or, or mobilise the micronutrients in our soils worldwide. You know? We are treating our soils as if they were an industrial you know, resource base. They are not. They are a living entity, and we have, to, we have to start responding to them that way. OK, so what are the solutions? The first thing that we are going to do is reinvent farming completely. We are going to develop what I call eco-farming, which is a marriage of the best thinking from organic agriculture and high science agriculture. Arbitrated by science because we have to test these ideas to see if they work well. This is going to come from minds such as yours, discussing not only amongst yourselves but with the other catchments in Australia and with other catchments all around the world. The people who most farmers get most of their farming knowledge from other farmers, let's face it. We need to generate a worldwide conversation. We've got the internet, we can do it. We've got social media, we can do it. Okay? This is not a national problem any longer. This is a human problem, and it's a human opportunity. We need to be at the cutting edge in coming up with a new eco-agriculture that protects the environment and at the same time increases productivity in food. Obviously, we are going to have to bang governments about the head and get them to massively reinvest in R&D. And I'm afraid the private sector is, is going to invest in the R&D that is profitable for them. They're not going to invest in the public good R&D. So we have to rearm CSIRO, the universities, the d departments of agriculture. They have to get back into this thing that they have been abandoning for the last 30 years. Right? And irrigation science would be a classic <coughs> example. I mean, we, we have gutted irrigation science in this country. And, and, and what a stupid thing to do when we know we're short of water. You know, when we know we're taking water off farmers for the environment. 
Like, surely you give them the knowledge to double their water use efficiency. And you offset the problem that way. Anyway, so that's... that's the global diet, it is important that we rethink it. You probably saw the news reports this week from Stockholm, from the World Water Congress, where the scientists were saying, actually, there's not going to be enough water for us to be able to eat meat in the 2050s. I don't happen to agree with that. I think that they have perhaps uh, somewhat e exaggerated the problem. But there's certainly, you know, we can modify the diet so it is healthier and it treads more lightly on the planet. And that's going to you know, profoundly influence the course of agriculture, the change in the diet. These things have to go hand in hand. And finally, what is a city? A city is a bloody great catchment for nutrients and water. And instead of flushing them into the Southern Ocean or the bloody Pacific or something, we need to connect, reconnect the pipe to the food producing industries. We need to get all those nutrients back uphill, you know, into the catchments, uh, the soil improvers, compost, I don't care how you do it, there's many, many ways of doing it. Um, and we need to start developing new industries, food producing industries, that can again reprocess those nutrients and I'll cover a couple of those. Okay, so here's our future farm. We're, 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 we're going to cease the war, the religious war that, between organic farmers and, uh, and high-tech farmers and, because there's brilliant farmers in both camps and we're going to share their ideas, and, and, and we're going to get scientists to test those ideas so we can then share them with millions of other farmers. I think we need a massive focus on soil biology. We've really neglected that area of science. You know, what goes on in the soil is more complicated, scientifically speaking, than what goes on in the human brain. Okay? You've got a billion organisms all interacting, you know, in, in, in a, a kilogram of soil or something. So. We need to understand that, and that is going to be the basis of the next surge in agricultural production. But at the moment, the soil is a black box. We, we cannot see into it, and we can't really manage it. So we, we, we need massive investment, in, especially in soil biology, but, but in all the other areas. Crop science, I'm fine with that. You know, nutrient recycling, carbon lockup, these are all becoming you know, parts of the agricultural equation now. Very exciting time, intellectually, for farmers. You know, I mean, this is... Farming is already complicated enough. It's going to get a hell of a lot more complicated. But it's going to be, it's going to be fun inventing new farming systems, testing them out, seeing if they work, making them work better, tuning them you know, to the environment. This is a time of great adventure in agriculture. This is the third agricultural revolution that we are now heading into. So we're going to develop that big thing. We'll even be farming in the deserts. I mean, that's an example of a... Of a uh, of a desert farm where you actually just use the sunlight and salt water and you purify, you, you, uh, you know, desalinate the water and, and grow crops in the desert. So we can do that in Australia. We've got lots of desert, got lots of salt water if we need to do so or if we can afford to do so. The other thing that is already starting to happen is that farms are moving back into cities. This, this big glass sphere is being built in Stockholm right as we speak. You know, there are huge investments being made in Holland, in Canada, all sorts of places. These urban farms are springing up. You know, there are fish and fresh vegetables being grown in old bowling alleys in Brooklyn and Manhattan, you know, where they, they have repealed the ordinances that sell, say that thou shalt not keep bees or goats in the city, you know. People are being allowed to do these things again. Cities are, are reimagining themselves. Um, the point is that if you have a farm in the city, it's very close to the source of water and nutrients that you can use. It's also climate proof because most of it's indoors. So unlike an agricultural system where you're pretty much at the mercy of the weather, you know, these systems are pretty insulated from the weather. So I, I urge you to think of, you know, if you're farming up here, you maybe have a diversification down there. What this new industry needs is knowledge, is skill, agricultural skill, a knowledge of livestock nutrition, plant nutrition, agronomy, all those kinds of things. Uh, you know, this is not going to be done by lawyers and accountants. They might be, it could be corporate agriculture. It could also be very small scale agriculture. People are doing this on their balconies now. Restaurants are growing fresh salad vegetables on the roof so that they can give their customers, their patrons, a salad that was harvested 15 minutes ago. Even big supermarket chains are looking at doing this. Hospitals in America are actually growing fresh veggies on the roof hydroponically so that they can feed them to patients as part of their recovery program. You know, there's lovely fits in all of these things. 
So this kind of thinking is going through the world now. And it's a very exciting time, and, and I urge you to think about being part of it. You're going to have, you know, these are some architect's co uh, concepts. You've probably seen Dixon des Pommiers' designs on the internet, you know. But the future city is going to be a glorious green place, you know. It's not going to be a horrid, windy, glass and concrete jungle, you know, like today. It's going to be full of life, vitality. And in Australia, you know, where we do have the climates to do this, I, I think this is very much an Australian opportunity, more than almost anywhere else. Something else that's going to happen, and you may or may not like this one, is that we are going to start growing very, very small <laughs> livestock, bugs, plant cells, fungal cells, en masse in large steel vats like that, and they will be food. Now, the advantage of something like that is it takes up very little land, uses very little water and energy, and does produce extremely nourishing, and the food can be very carefully profiled to the individual's health needs. But, you know, it's sludge. At the end of the day, it's industrial food. I can't see that we can avoid that because of the way supermarkets are driving down the price of commodities. They're going to drive the price of commodities so low that some food will have to be produced in factories. And this is an example. Maastricht University produced the world's first synthetic sausage last year. They promised us the world's first synthetic hamburger any moment. It is meat. It's animal stem cells fed on certain nutrients to turn them into muscle cells. It is going to be here on the market within five years, and it'll probably be a significant part of the meat supply within 10. Okay? If you're a cattle producer or lamb producer, don't go slash your wrists, because this is actually quite good news for you. You don't have to produce the rubbish. You can go up market. You can do what the wool growers did. I mean, the wool growers got taken over by synthetics. The dairy farmers got pushed out by the oil seed growers, and they diversified. I mean, think how many dairy products there are now compared to the 1970s. So <clears throat> this can be very beneficial. In fact, agriculture goes up market. It supplies the high price stuff, which means better incomes for farmers. And the factories supply the, you know. And at the moment, who knows what the hell is in a meat pie or a bloody sausage anyway, you know. I mean, Sawdust, you know, God knows, well, you know. <laughs> so, so, so to be honest with you, you know, this is this is not going to hurt you as much as as you might think, but we are going to get food from from different sources. The other thing is, we currently eat about two or three hundred plants worldwide. We are going. We haven't even explored this planet in terms of its culinary potential. There are twenty five thousand edible plants in, in a, a database being prepared by my colleague, agronomist Dr. Bruce French. So there is this phenomenal diversity. These 25,000, not only new foods, but also potentially new farming industries. You know, and, and, and think about it here. In Australia, there are 6,100 edible Australian plants. How many of them grow in this catchment? How many of them are farming industries at the moment? Five. You know, so we spent 250 years ignoring the biological bounty of Australia, studiously ignoring it. This is going to be the next wine industry, ladies and gentlemen, and it is going to be a critical part of, of, of sustainable agriculture, having more native species in our mix, in our cropping mix, and our livestock mix. Fish farming is going to boom. There's 1.5 million hectares of land in the north alone suitable for fish farming. You've got a lot of salty water here. You can grow snapper too, you know. It's going to be big time. This industry is going to be bigger than beef, lamb, uh, and <coughs> poultry and pork put together. You know, you can grow 10 tonnes of fish from a hectare of water. You only have to find something to feed them on. That, by the way, is an aquaponic farm growing vegetables and fish together. <coughs> what are we going to feed them on? We're going to farm algae. Sea plants, water plants, well, we're very good at growing them where we don't want them, like the Gippsland Lakes. You know? So we are now, this is going to be the boom industry of the future. Not only because they will produce food and stock feed, particularly for fish, but also because they will produce oil. Right? You can get 50 barrels of oil from a hectare of algae, and you'll only get five barrels of oil from a hectare of you know, canola. So you know, this, is, this is a massive new farming opportunity. We can grow the entire Australian oil supply. Every truck, every car, every aeroplane, every ship, every train from an area no larger than a large sheep station, 600,000 hectares. 
would make this country 100% self-sufficient in oil. At present, we are importing 80% of our oil. We are riding for a fall. Okay, if there's ever a problem in the Middle East. So that is going to be a $25 billion farming industry, which will be set up by the 2050s. Okay, so it's another huge opportunity. Our chance is to be the leader, or a leader, in this revolution. To share our knowledge generously around the world, to design the new diets, to bring agriculture and food closer together, more integrate them, to manage landscapes in ways that are sustainable and share that knowledge generously again, and to develop billion dollar new knowledge industries. And I put it to you that this is the future of CMAs, that in 25 years time they will transition to being large knowledge corporations. The world trade in knowledge is six billion do trillion dollars a year. It's much bigger than world trade in food. What is between your ears is more valuable than what is in your back paddock. Okay, so, so the knowledge coming out of a catchment like this where you know about water, <coughs> landscape, agriculture, can be, this can be a Silicon Valley, right? Think about it that way. So the challenge really for, for CMAs, you know, keep on doing what you're doing. Turn it into, package it and market it worldwide. Link up, join hands with all the other catchment people all around the world. You know, find opportunities through development agencies, military. You know, when the military goes into a country after a war, the first thing they have to do is bring, is recover the agriculture, recover the food supply. There are huge opportunities to export your knowledge, your skills, your technology to these parts of the world. We need to get on the front foot over there. Instead of sitting around moaning because the Chinese are buying Australia, we need to go to China and, and show them how to farm sustainably and efficiently. So don't just think about you know, this catchment and what it needs. Please think how you, how this catchment, can contribute to a better, more peaceful and more sustainable and well-fed world. Thank you very much. The question is, how do we get governments to think 50 years ahead? Well, governments are responsive to voters, right? So you actually have to get the voters to think 50 years ahead, and the politicians will go with them, otherwise they will not get elected. I would say there are probably going to be some significant food crises. We're on the world's third price crisis in four years already. Uh, so there are going to be some significant blips, and some of these are going to bring down governments. And I think that is going to get politicians' attention as well. We saw Egypt and Tunisia governments fall over last year. Um, so I think politicians are going to start paying more attention. At the moment, in countries that are food-blessed, like Australia, they're not paying enough attention. So we probably need to, we need to get a bit angry and manhandle a few politicians. I, I believe that's important. Um, and, and put, put the fear of God into them, you know, when they, when they come to, to the election. But we do need to get consumers. We need Master Chef. We need all the people who reach out to consumers, the celebrity people, to start thinking sustainable food, lighter diets, all that stuff, and, and use them to manipulate public opinion in favour of better food. Yeah, the question is about how do we limit the world's population. Uh, can I say the young women of the world... Whichever culture, society or nation you look at are not getting married and they're not having babies. It is a universal trend. The women have woken up that we are on an unsustainable course. They haven't consulted the blokes. They don't really want to know about the blokes. They are ignoring the ageing politicians and journalists and priests that keep telling them to have more babies because they know that is not the, the issue for the future. So the birth rate is falling because of that. It's coming off the boil. Even in Africa, it is coming off the boil. It's way off the boil in places like Japan and Sweden and, and so on. And if Australia didn't have migration, we would be going backwards in population terms too. Now, the biggest condom in the world is prosperity. Okay? When people get above a certain level of income, they stop having babies because babies are expensive. And also, urbanisation is another condom. When people move to cities, you don't need 12 kids to look after the farm because you're trying to fit them all into a flat, and they need shoes and school books and things like that. You know. So th these things actually happen quite naturally. We don't have to use you know, forceful measures. The women of the world will save us from ourselves if we allow them to do so. The challenge is that we have to feed the world while we're going through the population peak. 
so that it's a smooth ride up to the peak and then down again, not the classic biological peak where you go straight up and you come straight down like a rabbit plague, a locust plague or any other plague. So, you know, w w any plague that run outruns its resources comes a cropper in biology and we, we are not immune from the rules of biology. So we need to manage the population down. The women will do that for us, I believe. They're the wise ones. Um, and, and, but we've, got to, we've just got to come up with this much food for, as I say, about 50 or 60 years while they're getting the job done. Right, two questions. The, the first one is why are the departments stuck on what you might call the old model of agriculture? And I, I think probably because today they are entrained behind the big chemical companies and, and, and the big seed companies, you know, and, and you know, basically they're getting dollars to do research or whatever off those companies or helping with their extension. Unfortunately, they've been... And, and I, there's nothing wrong with what those companies do, but they should, their model should not dominate the whole of agriculture. Now, this is resilience thinking, right? You need to have mass variety and diversity in agriculture, just as you do on the Great Barrier Reef, you know, for it to have a viable organism. So we need as much diversity as we can get. I believe we, 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 we need to get back. I, I think we put this vision, you know, of the sustainable agriculture. That will drive policy, and policy in, in turn will, will correct. But we do need to get that reinvestment in public good, sustainability-based agriculture because the companies will not solve those problems for it. It's not in their interests to do so. Question about farmers. Um, look, I actually think that farmers are going to get such pleasure, such enjoyment, out of talking to other farmers who grow the same thing on the opposite side of the world. You know, once we start sharing our ideas on social media, on the internet, and a really vibrant conversation springs up between farmers, that even isolated old Australian farmers who will normally face you with two dogs and a shotgun across the fence, you know, will, will actually start, you know, they'll be on the internet at night sharing ideas with, with, with fellow producers in different parts of the world. And I would like, you know, for this catchment to be, if you like, a fountainhead of this going out and sharing and chatting, first of all, to New Zealand farmers and South African farmers and Argentinian farmers and so on, and seeing how much knowledge we can get moving around. So I, this is a stimulus. I think farmers are going to have to rediscover co-ops and cooperation in all its form. You know, we, we, we have done it. The Dutch and the Germans are still doing this, but most other farmers have lost it. Um, but, I, you know, that's the short answer. I think this is going to be a rather thrilling place to be, and, and farmers are going to get a buzz out of it. Absolutely. The question is about education and how we reconnect 8 billion <coughs> urban citizens, because that's what this is going to be in 2050, with the food supply, with where the food comes from. My answer is that we start by campaigning for a, a year of food in every junior school on the planet. And that is a year when you're not studying agriculture, but you're studying food, whatever you, subject you take, science, mathematics, domestic science, sport. Each of those subjects has got a food message. In sport you learn about where your energy comes from and what is good to eat and what is bad to eat, you know. So, so you're getting a little bit of a message about food. In geography you learn about where food is grown uh, and which parts of the planet need to be looked after to protect that food supply. So these 8 billion urban human beings will never set foot on a farm in their lives probably unless it's an urban farm. So they're going to be totally cut off and if we let them, they will send the wrong economic signal to farmers about what to grow and how to grow it. Okay, so that will do, if they don't understand the need for sustainability in agriculture, you will not be paid to be sustainable. That is the, that is the frightening element here. So I would like to start that off. Stephanie Alexander's already got 300 um, schools in Australia where kids grow their own, prepare it, eat it, you know, and, and are getting engaged in the whole process. They're, they're understanding the food cycle. The kids can start educating their parents. We've seen that happen with Clean Up Australia. You know, the kids are great teachers. So we get to the kids first. And, and, and we make this a part of the education of every child on earth. It's acceptable in every culture. Nobody, food is part of everybody's culture and civilization. You, you might have to translate it a bit for different cultural groups. But the same essential messages um, are common to the entire of humanity. So I actually think, again, this can be, we need to just modify very slightly the curriculum. New South Wales farmers have got a plan to do that, and I heartily applaud that. As I say, Stephanie Alexander's working on it. 
let's link up with those people and push this as a matter of national policy. Australia should do it here, and then we should take it to the United Nations and say, look, we've got the model, you know, we can do this in America, Japan, you know, Africa.